The second problem that I'd like to talk to you about today is using that darn muggle money that Mr. Weasley has so much trouble with. Now I'm talking about the muggle money that they have in Britain and I'm actually talking about the muggle money that they had in Britain in the 1970s but it's kind of a fun system and it's understandable why Mr. Weasley was confused by it especially if you live in America as I do. The thing that we would think of as a penny in Britain at the time was called the pence, and it was worth one unit in the same sense that our penny is sort of the foundational unit of our currency system. However, when we think of something like a dollar as having a hundred pennies, at this point in time in Britain, you were thinking of something that had 240 pence as being equivalent to our dollar. So it was a very different kind of system, and you can see that inherent in the worth of the coins that they have. So there was a pence and a two pence and a three pence and a six pence. Again, focusing on divisors of 240 as opposed to divisors of 100 with lots of fives and tens the way we have in American currency. And then there was the shilling, which they could have called a 12 pence, but decided to give its own name, and a florin, which is equal to two shillings, but got its own name and was worth 24 pence. And then, because 30 is also a divisor of 240, and it's useful to have that denomination, there's something called a half crown, which is equal to two shillings and a sixpence, as it's commonly referred, but there was a denomination of currency that was worth those two shillings and a sixpence. So this is the money system that we are going to be dealing with. We just had a whole bunch of Harry Potter characters that had debts that needed to be paid to one another. Let's imagine that when we pay these debts, we're gonna use muggle money because that's entertaining, this muggle money. And because it's just for entertainment's sake, we don't wanna have a whole bunch of pence running around. If you owe me 110 pence, I don't want 110 pence. I want it in a handful of different fun vibrant coins and I want to carry around as few coins as I possibly can. Let's see how we can do this with the debts that need to be paid from the previous example. So the debts that needed to be paid were 15 units, 25 units, 60 units, 5 units, and 110 units. And because these are small quantities using the chart on the previous page, we can see how to do them. Now there was no 15 pence coins, so we're going to need to do this in two coins at the very least. A shilling is worth 12 of them, and we have a three pence coin, so two coins can accomplish creating something that's worth 15 pence. Similarly, we can go through and see that, uh, that something that was a 25 pence, well we have a florin which is worth 24 pence, and we have a pence. So there is no coin that's worth 25, but we can accomplish this with two coins. And similarly, for the remaining quantities here, each of these, the 60 and the 5, can be obtained with two of the coins that we had on the previous page. Now 110 is a much more interesting number, and one way to get to 110 is to start with the largest coin that we had on the previous page, which was the half crown three of those will get you up to 90 pence. So we'll have 20 pence left over. But remember, this we don't have a 10 pence coin the way we would have a dime in American currency. So the best we can do at that point is get towards that units of 20 by taking a shilling, which would be 12 of those pence. We'd have eight left over, but luckily we have a six pence and a two pence as an opportunity there. So one way to obtain 110 pence would be to, via this decomposition. And this decomposition is a greedy decomposition. Take the largest coin that we have, take as many of them as we can have that fits into this quantity without going over, do a little subtraction and repeat that process. And so there's a greedy algorithm using the table from the previous slide that we can put into place to talk about generating change. Now your mission for this week, should you choose to accept it, is going to be to program both of these algorithms. So for the first algorithm, create a program that uses a greedy algorithm, greedy because we're finding the largest debtor and the largest creditor and settling the biggest debts first in a recursive manner. So let's create a program that does that task for us using a greedy algorithm to come up with um, ideal monetary exchanges under that system.
Let's then do the same with the muggle money concept. So using the denominations of coins that I've listed in these slides, create a program that uses a greedy algorithm, uses the most of the largest denomination you have at first to build these quantities, does a subtraction and then recursively calls the, calls the algorithm again. Let's write a program that uses that greedy algorithm to figure out how to decompose these quantities of pence in terms of the coins that we had available to us. And then the most important part of this whole issue, one of these programs is going to give you an optimal solution for the whole problem. So for example, on the first one, it would create a diagram that has as, as few exchanges of money as possible, or for the second program, we'd be talking about one that actually does create the fewest number of coins needed in order to make this exchange. But one of these programs that employs a greedy algorithm does not actually give you the optimal solution. And so I want you to think about which one it is and see if you can mess around with and create examples and do some testing in your programs to figure out which greedy algorithm is actually an optimal algorithm and which greedy algorithm is just a greedy algorithm but doesn't actually get you to the best algorithm you could employ for that situation.